There we go. All right. So I got 30 minutes, and I'm going to go all over the map here in 30 minutes. Um, I've done a bunch of these hackathons in the last couple of years. And I mean, I'm excited that standards are starting to become a part of it. It's, I mean, the spirit of a hackathon, of course, is get something done as quickly as you possibly can and then show it off and come up with a pitch at the end or whatever. And I mean, standards for the longest time have been, I mean, the thought that you would, that standards would be a part of that is kind of ridiculous. Like standards slow you down and all of that. I feel like things are changing. Fire's been a game changer in that regard. And people are actually starting to find that standards help you do stuff faster, which is the spirit of hackathons. So the concepts work really well together. So hopefully over the next half hour, I can kind of share a little bit of that and, I don't know, excite some people about this stuff. So I love starting with this, this little example, the power of APIs. Uh, 2006, Twitter put out a data API. They basically put this thing out thinking, you know, someone will come up with a neat Twitter client or someone will, you know, create this new fancy way of posting to Twitter or something. I mean, the, you know, they had basic plans they talked about when this put, they put this API out. But the power of APIs, of course, were that people took that and they ran with it. People put out, you know, people used people tweeting about earthquakes to form, to, be, to function as an earthquake detector. And they were predicting, or not predicting, but they were sort of recognizing that earthquakes were happening faster than even the earthquake detection boxes were doing it. Um, flu outbreaks is another really interesting one. People, you know, they started, people started looking for people tweeting about, I've got the flu. And they were predicting that flu, you know, that, uh, that, that flu outbreaks were happening before anyone had any idea they were happening. So point is there, you put data in people's hands, people will do unexpected and crazy things with them. They'll delight you with them. So why are we all here? I, I like this one too. Uh, the EHR, for the longest time, has been surrounded by a moat. It's a, you know, it's a wealth of data. It's got a big lake, and then there's people with interesting ideas, the hackers, so to speak, who sit outside that, peering in. My job for the last 12 years, up until not too long ago, I was, I was actually the guy in the middle of that. I've spent a long time working within the confines of the health system up in Canada, making our systems talk to each other. Um, you know, wishing I could help those innovative ideas people more, but not really having a great way of doing that. Maybe a year ago, I, I just decided to make a gamble that, uh, that, that I don't know, standards and, and apps for health basically was the, was the future. So I jumped ship and I'm now with the Center for Global e Health Innovation working on apps for health. Um, let's talk a little bit about the background and all this stuff and why it was so hard for the longest time. I'm not going to go for, go on for too long about this stuff, but uh, I don't know how many of you guys have dealt with legacy HL7 version 2 messaging. Uh, it's neat stuff. I mean, it's been around for many, many years. Uh, and it largely works. It consists of, it's got this sort of fire and forget pattern where if I'm ordering, you know, if I'm ordering a lab test, for instance, there's a very specific message that will go from my EMR into my lab system, and the lab system will send back a very specific V2 message to say, here's the result for that. Um, there's a couple of problems with it, for sure. Uh, the messages, frankly, are, are ugly. I mean, those of us who have been doing it for years love them because we can glean amazing amounts of information in no time, but they're ugly. Typically, they're not encrypted. Uh, these are just the two, two of the biggest problems I've got with them, but there's all kinds of others. You can kind of see an example there of what one of these messages looks like. They're, uh, I don't know. They're pretty to me, but they're ugly to lots of people. Uh, along came version 3. So version 3 did, you know, they tried to solve all of this with 1995 state-of-the-art technology. So XML and UML, and we're looking at a model. I know no one can read that, and that's kind of the point. It's, they're really, really difficult things to deal with. The messages look like this, and if you talk to anyone, myself included, who's ever worked with one of these things, they'll give you quotes like this about what's going on in those things. They're really unpleasant to read. Um, so, out with the old, in with the new. We're here to talk about fire. Before we talk about fire, why am I excited about all of this stuff? Focused apps are the future. So, I think we have, we've probably got Steve Jobs to thank for this, uh, or curse, depending on your perspective. But everyone who's out there trying to solve a problem expects that there's an app that meets their exact problem and solves it perfectly. And that's, that's cool. I mean, that's, you know, I'm a software developer. I love the idea of taking someone's very specific problem and solving it very specifically. Uh, this is an app that we developed at the Center for Global e Health Innovation for patients trying to manage hypertension. 
we send patients home with uh, this app, basically, uh, which talks via Bluetooth to a weight scale and a pressure cuff monitor and you know things like that. Helps them track what they're doing and gives them feedback on their progress, reports it back to their doctor. This kind of stuff, I think, is the future. And it's designed very specifically with someone with hypertension in mind. So nothing that's not useful to that specific patient population. This is one for diabetes. So problems in diabetes are obviously very different. So this one, you know, in this app, we're helping people sort of track how their A1Cs are doing. We're, uh, we're helping them sort of take pictures of the food they're eating and compare, you know, go back and look. OK, my blood sugar was looking bad. Hey, what did I eat just before that? That's what I ate. It's in a picture. Apps are changing the world. This is, I mean, just one more example. This is, uh, I mean, very sort of childlike UI. This, that's because this is for kids with chronic pain. So again, we're trying to, you know, we're helping kids track their pain through UIs that make sense for them. So mashup apps. Let's talk about what those things look like. All of the apps we do, I mean, really, we can kind of boil them down to a bunch of, a bunch of common things. We, we take a bunch of inputs, and we sort of mash that stuff together. So in our world, this is wearable. So we're talking about the Fitbits, the Bluetooth glucose monitors, the Bluetooth weight scales, all that type of stuff. Uh, we collect data through questionnaires. So in our world, this is patients self-reporting that they fainted, or that their pain is a 9 out of 10, or their sexual function has decreased, that type of stuff. Um, we've got, you know, so we've got that. Then we're taking some data out of the EHR. So we're maybe pulling down what's your last year worth of A1C values, or what meds have you been prescribed recently, or what treatments were ordered for you. We're mashing that stuff up. Uh, we produce some outputs out of this stuff. So, you know, we're helping patients make sense of their data. This is an important thing in the, in the, in the modern world. Patients these days are not just one-way consumers of health, where you go to a doctor, the doctor tells you something, and you go home and do it. We expect, as patients, uh, to, be a, you know, to be an active participant. And I think everyone benefits from that. So apps are, are a great way of, of making that come, come to life. We help clinicians identify trends. So with a patient at home using an app, trends will jump right out at you. You can tell that a patient is crashing or doing well. And you can either prevent them from having to worry about things, or you can have the doctor know right away when there's a problem so they can get on top of it before it becomes an even bigger problem. How do we build these things? <sighs> the old way. So I mean, this is getting into why I love Fire. For the longest time, these apps were built using the following steps. You'd build an app. You'd build a server to talk to that app. You would integrate it with the med system. You'd integrate it with the lab system. You'd fight with the EMR to get a bit of data out of there. You would fight with every other system. Eventually, you'd get this thing working. All of the stuff we talked about this morning, the Fire data model, the OAuth protocol, Smart on Fire that brings that stuff together, that's the new way of doing this stuff. Step one, build an app. Step two, profit. You're done. So I'm not going to go through what Fire is but, uh, in, in a whole lot of detail, because that's not the point here. But Fire is four things. A data model, of course, a RESTful API for interacting with that data model, a set of servers you can talk to, and a set of open source tools. And we are going to focus in on the last two uh, with what 15 minutes I've got left. Fire servers. So there's a bunch of them out there. As you're developing your apps, this is really, I mean, it's one of the coolest things about Fire is that there are Fire servers all over the internet that you can use to talk to. If you want to test against data that looks like this or like that, there's a server. If you want to try uploading data and comparing it with other bits of data, there's servers you can play with. Uh, I've listed two of them up here, and I'm going to show you one of them a bit later. But there's a bunch more, too, that, uh, that are out there. Um, oops, that slide existed twice. There's also open source tooling all over the place. Uh, Happy, which I'm going to talk about in a second, is a Java implementation. There's a great .NET API uh, for the .NET developers. There are libraries for Swift. There's libraries for JavaScript. Uh, there's a Delphi one that's out there. Frankly, for the app developers, you don't even necessarily need a library. This is the best part about it. The data models are so simplistic, and the querying is so easy to do. You, you really don't. Our iOS developers today are actually not even using any sort of prepackaged library. They're using JSON parsing and a, and a REST API that is, uh, is a part of the iOS platform. So you don't even need, necessarily need one the best part. So happy fire. That's the second half of what we're going to talk about. Uh, diving right down, 
I am the project lead for a project called Happy. Uh, Happy is an open source implementation of HL7. We're Apache 2 licensed. Um, we implement, well, we implement HL7 version 2. Uh, the project has existed now for 15 years, actually, uh, implementing the HL7 version 2 specifications. As of about two years ago, we decided we would start looking at Fire and see what we could do about implementing the Fire specifications in Java as well. Happy Fire is quite a few things. Uh, it's a data model, so we have a set of Java classes, of course, that, rep that will model everything there is in the Fire data model. So, you know, if you're talking about patients or observations or encounters or any of the many things you might ever deal with, Happy has got classes that deal with all of that stuff. Happy is a parser, so you can take the strings, uh, you know, the serialized data that is a Fire resource and turn that into Java. You can turn Java into the serialized, uh, you know, the, stri the, the XML or the JSON version of that. Happy is an HTTP client, uh, and I'm going to focus a bit more on that in a bit, just because for the app developers, the client is really the, uh, the key bit to it. Happy is a server, though, as well. So if you were trying to stand up a Fire server, let's say you've got a database that has a bunch of data, clinical research, whatever you've got. Happy will very quickly let you stuff an HL7 Fire, or sorry, a Fire, uh, a fire interface on top of that, just mapping whatever your data sources are into Fire resources and exporting that as a RESTful API. Uh, fire is a, a JPA store, a resource storage module, so this is basically, if you don't have your own database, you just need a database to store Fire resources locally, Happy's got a module for that. We've got an Android client, and we've got a command line tool, which will let you do things like validate resources, and more importantly, the command line tool will start a Fire server on your, on your local computer if that's useful to you. So if, as a part of your testing, you want a Fire server that belongs to you and you only on your own computer because you've got no network or you want private data on it, our command line tool will stand that up for you in a matter of seconds. So the data model, uh, let's talk a little bit about the code and how that all fits together. This is pulled straight off the FIRE we uh, website, and we're looking at the data model for an observation resource. Um, Happy has modeled all of that stuff. So what FIRE calls a patient resource, we have a class that's called patient.java, as you might expect. Uh, we've got observation.java, encounter.java, you know, medication order.java, all of those things exist. All of the data types that are defined as a part of Fire have their own classes as well. String, DT, everything ends in DT, quantity DT, human name DT, they all exist in there. Uh, there's a bunch of jar files that we, you, uh, you would import. You can import a different one depending on the, the version of Fire itself you're trying to support. DSTU2 is the latest version that's out there. Chances are if you're building something right now, DSTU2 is what you want to be using. It's what we're using for all of our internal work. Uh, and there's a jar that ends in dstu2.jar that you would import to, uh, to, you to do that. So a little bit of Java code. Uh, and I will point out that uh, basically all of this, if, uh, if anyone is using .NET, the .NET code actually looks almost identical to this. There are naturally differences because the language has different conventions, but the code really mostly looks the same. Uh, this is an example of creating an observation. I'll highlight a couple of things. We've got enumerate, we've got Java enums basically for any of the stuff that's enumerated. So the status of an observation can be final or in progress or ordered. Uh, we've got enums for that. Everything is designed with this really nice sort of modern Java way of doing things, which is to, to, to do these fluent method chains across. So as we're setting codes, you know, you chain one thing to the next. It's all sort of designed to work that way. Uh, the parser. So to create, to, to do parsing, essentially you create an instance of a parser. This is a couple of lines to do that. Uh, you call the parser and say, I want you to encode my resource to a string. Out comes this. So that's, this is a little bit of code that will spit this all out. Probably should have mentioned at the start. I've got a link at the end with a, uh, a GitHub repo that actually has the source codes for these examples. So if anyone wants to try them, they're up there. The client. This is where things get fun if you're an app developer. So Happy does have a very sort of powerful and full-featured client for talking to Fire servers. Uh, this is a really basic example. So this is reading an individual patient resource by its ID um, and then serializing out the uh, serial serializing out the output of that. Um, oh, and I thought I had the output of that, but I don't. Either way, we, uh, we create this thing that's called a context. We ask for a client. We tell it what the URL for the client is. 
We chain together a bunch of methods, dot read, dot resource, dot with ID, dot execute. Um, depending on what you're doing to the fire server, it's always going to end up looking like that. If you're searching, it's going to be client, dot search, dot, you know, by name or whatever. Uh, it's all designed so that you're, you know, you've got the IntelliSense in your ID, Eclipse or IDEA or whatever. The autocomplete will always sort of help you figure out how do you build the queries because the client is designed to, to take advantage of all of that. Finding help. So over the next while, of course, you'll, uh, you'll be building things. You'll need to find some help. There's lots of good stuff out there on how to use Happy. Uh, I'll start by mentioning our website has tons of examples. So it's on GitHub. You can go in there. I'm not going to click it now, but if you go to the link, you will find lots and lots of code samples on how to do basically anything you could possibly imagine. We have a very active Google group as well uh, that's specific to, to Happy Fire. So if you ask a question about how to do anything in Java there, uh, you will get an answer generally quite quickly. Uh, lots of people like to try asking us questions about .NET as well, but there's a separate group for that, so we send them there. Uh, I, should have, I should, should have mentioned on this slide as well, there's also a Skype channel for people interested in Fire itself as opposed to people with Java-specific questions. Uh, if you speak to uh, Josh or myself or Lloyd, we can uh, help hook you up on there. Uh, the codes, there's a bunch of code samples, of course, that are being uploaded as we speak. And the last thing I will mention in terms of stuff that can help you is our test server, which I'm going to go to right now. So, uh, yeah, you can't read the URL there, firetest.uhn.ca. It's in the, uh, in the presentation as well. Either way, this is a test server. This is an open server on the internet anyone can play with. It's got lots and lots of stuff. One of the things it's got is a nice little query builder to help you interact with resources. So I'm going to look for observations. If I click on observation, I'm now searching for observations. I can you know, pick the things I want to search by. So if I want to look for observations by their code or whatever, I can do that. Just as a really simple example, I'm going to do a full text search on the entire text of the resource, that's underscore content, and say I'm going to search for observations with white blood in the, uh, in the text. I just find that makes for a nice quick demo. If I go through here, I'm looking at the, you know, all of the data that's come back, and I've got some white blood cells in urine as, as an example. So anything you can think of you want to search for, this will help you build what the queries look like. And this has been the tool that we use for people that aren't even using an API. They will play with this until they figure out what's the URL I need for the query I want to make. Then they bring that URL into Xcode and implement it, and that's the way that works. I will mention Happy, of course, is an open source project. Uh, we've been at it for 15 years now. We're always looking for new contributors. So if anyone is interested in joining our efforts, um, I mean, we're Java, so if you, uh, I guess you have to know Java in order to be really particularly helpful to us, but <laughs> as long as you have that, that's basically the only requirement. Uh, we have, the Fire Library's been around for 18 months now, and I think we've had probably about 25 people contribute something to it in terms of code, so we're always looking for more. Get in touch if you want to. That's all I have to say. Oh, and I'm right on time. Sure. So I got some time for questions here. Oh, that's easy. Fair enough. Uh, I guess I mean, for, if there's no questions, I mean, the one other thing I'll mention is I will be, of course, around for the rest of the day. So if anyone wants to chat about how do I do this or that or what library is appropriate for what I'm trying to do, uh, even if it's not Java, happy to chat about that. So let's talk. Absolutely. So. I mean, the basic deal with this, I mean, first off, for app developers especially, you really don't. Um, I mean, as I, you know, as I say, our, our, our iOS developers, I mean, the library doesn't work in iOS in the first place. And they looked at what libraries could we use. They basically found, like, there's no point. The, the data models are nice and simple, so the whole, thing, the whole thing works. The Android developers do use it, and the reason they use it is Happy, at a, very, at a base minimum, does give you nice IntelliSense completion on, like code completion, basically. So if you're building code that is querying, you know, you can hit command space or control space, and it'll tell you what are the list of attributes on, you know, on a patient resource and all of that. So that part's nice. Um, really where it shines more, though, is in the server implementation, just because implementing a RESTful server it's not rocket science, but it's not trivial either. Happy, it, it takes, Happy spends a lot of time sort of getting itself to the point where if you're writing a server, you literally create a class and create a method that is 
it's got a couple of really special annotations it defines, and it'll just turn around that, turn that around, and make a make an entire sort of functional RESTful server out of that. And it, it does things like export a conformance statement for you. It, it takes a lot of the sort of plumbing out of that. So really, I mean, it's the server where I think Happy really shines. On the client, it's helpful, but less so. so. Yes. Yeah, so the server, um, given that I have time, let me see. I didn't focus much on the server, of course, just because uh, it's less useful to the app developers. But if I have an, a, uh, let me just see if I can show you an example of how it looks. Server, 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 server. I mean, the bottom answer, the, the bottom line to that is it is, essentially infinitely uh, configurable. This is an example of, of a class. The way that the server works is you create these classes that are what Happy Fire server calls a resource provider. The idea is if I want to export the patient resource as a part of my server, I create this class that's called the patient resource provider. Happy just has a bunch of these special annotations that you put on whatever methods you want to implement in your server. So if, if the idea is I want to implement a server that supports read, you know, reading patients by their ID as well as searching for them by last name or searching for them by last name and date of birth. Um, I can create basically methods. I use the annotations and I tell it this is exactly, like these are the search parameter combinations I want to support. These are the operations I want to support. Happy just looks at all those annotations in the resource provider methods and s spins that up into a server. When something comes, you know, when a URL comes in, it sort of looks at it and says, okay, this is a search by date of birth and, and last name or whatever, looks for the method that's appropriate for that and calls that method. You know, on, this, on the same side, there's, you know, there's different annotations for like creating resources that you either use or don't, depending on whether your underlying database supports that. Everything essentially is sort of configurable depending on what your underlying data sources support. So, I, you know, the short answer to that is it's more or less infinitely configurable just because that was what we needed it for when we built it. Cool. Thank you.